Library Society on MCC campus. So tonight features guests whom I hope you greatly appreciate as much as I do. And I hope that we will learn today about the Holocaust in a very unorthodox manner. And um, so our interactive experience tonight is requires you to be interactive with the discussion. It requires you to be um, able to speak up when we ask questions and I hope you guys are comfortable with that dialogue because tonight we will be getting into some really good questions about what our society is, what discrimination is, and how we can combat it. And so, real quick, for discussions, we will have ground rules. It's just three simple rules. Number one, be respectful to each other. Don't demean anyone because of something that they said. Number two, Make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. If you've spoken a lot already and um, someone looks like they want to they turn, give them one. And the third, be honest about your answers. These, these questions are, are things that are very heavy. It is a heavy topic. Um, but as long as you be honest, you're raw, you're real, I think that we can build some type of community together to be able to speak about those heavy topics in a manner that is educational to all parties around us. Yeah? yeah. So, so, without further ado, we have our first speaker coming up. Um, he is a survivor, and he was in Germany when it happened, and his name is Oscar Noble, but out of respect. Uh, Mr. Knobloch, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Let's try again. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. I like to see everyone being awake. Please read that little slide. Respect. Would you believe that this is a very important word in my vocabulary? If not for respect, I would be standing here today talking to you. And the respect was given to me, not by one, or two or three during this couple men that gave me life. Not in jail, but they instead of killing me, they gave me that life. I was born in Germany in nineteen twenty five. My family this border was taken in nineteen thirty two. In Germany, in Leipzig, Germany. I was seven years old, the little guy with a smirk on his face. And as you can see, in 1932, we all had smiles on our faces and we looked decent, supposedly just like our neighbors or anyone else. No difference. So we were Jewish. Our neighbors were not. They were Christians, wonderful people. Their son, a year older than I, Günther, best friends. We were like brothers. Ilse, my sister, the oldest, and his sister, Günther's, same age, same way. They treated themselves like sisters. So life was good in 1932. <laughs> However, there were some people trying to come to power. You all are aware of the Nazi party. They tried very desperately. Now the question is, how does one get to power starting from scratch? Germany was in bad shape after World War I. Had 
if you read the option. And yes, there are some Jewish people living in Germany. We have a nation of 50 million Germans and approximately 750,000 Jews. And yes, some of the Jews were rather rich. They were the ones who were actually building up Germany after World War I. The Nazis trying to come to power had one enemy in Germany. It wasn't a Jew. It was the Communist. The Communist Party in Germany at that time was strong, trying to come to power. Jewish people don't like communism. So they were financing other parties just to make sure that the communists don't come to power. Enter Adolf Hitler, obscure from nowhere. He decided, because Germany at the time had the same rights as we have here today, the freedom of speech. A wonderful thing. Imagine, I can stand here and say what I want to say. But I have to watch myself. What I say. I should not insult people. I should not tell lies. Because words do matter. The Nazi didn't care. He started off with lies. People like this man, Joseph Gills, a poison tongue, a liar. Before they became the ruling party, they were issued warnings by the courts in Germany that he's telling lies. And he said, yes, and I will continue telling those lies until people believe in them. Well, we know that freedom of speech equals propaganda. Propaganda is a terrible, terrible thing. I still remember Hitler saying many times that propaganda is a terrible weapon. That's right. The terrible weapon in the hands of experts. And the Nazis were experts. The ingredients to get to power by a dictator are very simple. First, Use scare tactic. Scare the people. Once you accomplish that, you have to add something. What do you add? The race card. In this particular case, it was the Jews. Enter the Jews, mix them up with hate. Scare. And the people start to believe in all this. So the enemy suddenly is not the communist, even though that the Jews are being claimed that they are the ones who are the communists, that they run the party. Hitler was very smart. He knew that Jews do not like communism. The Jew doesn't want to give up his money. Communism is what's yours is mine. What's mine is yours. They didn't want to give that up. And they were fighting so that they shouldn't get into power. But yet, Hitler was able to persuade all of the Germans that the Jews were the ones who are the communists. And so therefore, they are the ones who are the enemy of the state. They have to be done away with. Exterminate, possibly. That was the first notion. They had other people championing for the Nazis. The Stürmer, a publication which came out every week. A horrible piece of paper. 
in the very fact of it. Insulting the Jews for being the worst corrupted people in the world. And when people are down and under, and they have no jobs, and if they have a leader who's telling them, yes, I will find jobs for you, and yes, as Hitler would say, I will build Germany to be great again. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? The Jew was portrayed as something evil. This is a page from the newspaper of the Sturmer. This is what the Jew looks like. You've seen my family, you've seen me. Do I look anything like this? It doesn't resemble anything like this. But the Sturmer insisted that the Jews are rich, they're fat, they have long noses, and they're there to take over their country. And people believed it. Not only is he rich and filthy looking, but he also is a communist. You see, they got it all in one slide, everything put together. And now, millions of people see this. And what do you suppose happens in their minds? Oh, we have to get rid of those people. Those people are not good. And mushroom. Honestly, now, I just wonder sometimes, you know, if this would appear in our newspapers here, how would people think about it? Chances are some people would believe it. Because for the simple reason that Germany was a pretty good sized country, and yes, there were communities where Jews never lived ever, ever, where people have never met a Jew or seen a Jew, shook hands with a Jew. People would be born, they die, <coughs> a new generation would come in, after generation. And when all this appeared in their newspapers with the lies of the Nazis, they believed in it. And they hated the Jews. You see how you can work with the human mind. You can infect it. You can make it work your way. All you have to do is keep on lying and promise. Promise everything they want to hear, even if you cannot deliver it. This is exactly what Hitler did. Now Hitler, to a certain extent, kept his, his, his word, so to speak. Well, sure, you know, he, he created jobs with money he, he took from the Jews, with money he didn't pay back to the West for World War I to use that money to produce shovels and pickaxes and wheelbarrows. And he put hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people to work, manual work. But it was good enough to bring bread, honey, and milk home to their families, jobs they didn't have before. The Autobahn was created, something we copied, incidentally. General Eisenhower, after World War II, thought that was the greatest thing. And so he brought it to the United States, and now we have all the freeways. Copied just like an Autobahn. So he was, to a certain extent, honest but not when it came to people. Not when it came to people. He was not up to par. In 1933, when he became this, this leader of that country, everything changed. You know, my friend, Günther, my best friend, I mean like a brother, he was 
not be talked to anymore. He joined the Hitler Youth. You know, as kids, we belonged to a sports club in Germany. It was great. School was great. I went to school for three years. But imagine, this was at the end of 1933, beginning of 34. Going to the sports club as usual with my brother, with Ginter, and myself. The coaches who knew us so well, who were standing in front and said, you guys, you Jews, you don't come in here anymore. This is only for aliens, for the muscle race. We don't belong here. Get out. My teacher, I said in front, you will not be sitting at your desk anymore. You will be sitting in the back, and you will not participate in any school activities. Imagine, you are eight years old, and you go to school, and you sit there, and you do absolutely nothing. You can't participate. The school has 900 and some odd children, 12 Jewish kids in that whole school, being treated like we don't belong. And by the way, Hitler didn't waste any time to label the Jews as subhuman. So I have a good look at the subhuman here. Your rights ceased. You have no rights. Can't go anywhere. Transportation is all shut down for you. And there was a law in Germany, which wasn't really a law from the whole country. Sometimes different cities could make their own laws regarding the Jews. A mayor, he could decide one day of the week that no Jew is allowed on the street. And it worked. That was the beginning. The beginning of the Holocaust, so to speak. So to get back to this, words, pictures, accusations, freedom of speech, it matters. Do it the right way. I think the next slide is somewhat familiar. Not quite. I think I, may, I put it out too fast the other day. But that's another scene. This is what the Jews are being portrayed by the Nazis. Imagine that people see this. They develop anger and hate. Hate creates the Holocaust. Look familiar? This is not long ago, right here in the United States. They associate that woman with Jewishness, with money. The man is, must have been taken the uh, handbook from Hitler. And we did nothing. And nobody said nothing. And when he was accused of doing something here which is racist, he had a lie. Oh, no, it's not really. It's not really a, a, a Jewish star. Really. You see, in Germany, while all this was going on, we had a lot of bystanders. Bystanders do nothing. Now, while all this was shown, that was before he was in power, if the people would have stood up and said something about it, this is wrong. Our neighbors knew we didn't look like this, but they didn't stand up for us. And so did even many others did. So this is wrong. This is why when you see something like this happening in this country, it is our duty to do something about it. You don't just sit back and say, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just a picture. But so are the other pictures. There weren't even pictures. There were drawings. 
This is a photograph that's worse, and we do nothing. Your adults don't be bystanders. They're useless people, totally useless. They do nothing. Become an upstander. Become a, a bystander who is a positive bystander. Upstander is a nice word. A new word in the dictionary. Webster's, Oxford, they accepted it about two years ago. To be an upstander is a great thing. It's a marvelous thing. It's something you would do for someone else, and who knows, you might even save a whole nation. So remember that. We cannot sit back and say nothing. Of course, the Germans prided themselves that everybody should look like this. This is an Aryan. Well, how many Aryans are there? Raise your hand. You look like this. You got blonde eyes, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Ginger didn't look like this. Ginger looked like me. Brown hair, brown eyes. Same height, no difference. Sure, you joined Italy. Ah, no problem. His sister, too. Very sexy looking girls. Once you join, you do the things the leaders tell you to do. You can see what's happening here. You're burning books. Books they don't want you to read anymore. There were school books, books for libraries. They would even come to homes, our home. So you see, this is how things change. And books were replaced, by the way. And while I'm still in school, I had to listen, sitting in the back, how the teacher was teaching the kids how to eat me in school, legally. See, that time was too late for anyone to speak up. So you see, this is just a brief little thing about how you can come to power. What tools do you use? And those are the tools he used. And today, people use the same tools, whether it's in this country, in other countries, wherever a dictator wants to come to power. They use lies, deception, scare tactic, promises, which they're not giving, even. It's very simple. So what is your duty? Your duty is to keep your eyes and ears open. Most of you have a whole life ahead of you. It is your country, your neighborhood, your life. You want to raise a family. Well, think what kind of a family and where do you want to raise them. Thinking is good. You know, I had very good parents. My father always told us to stay strong. Not with your fists, but in your mind. He said, this is your weapon, your brain. Do 100%, whatever you do in life, in school, at work. That's fine. 100% is great, but it's outdated. For you guys, for you young guys. What you need is now 110. Strive for 110. Educate yourself. The more education you get, the brighter you will be, obviously. And you will achieve more in your life. And you will have a better life. And remember, you get only one shot at life. One ride. Like one ride on the miracle round. The ticket is over. The music stops and you're off. So do the best you can with the time you have. Time is of essence.
time cannot be bought. Don't waste it. It's too precious. I can go on because this is just the beginning. We're not even yet at the Holocaust. But all I want to tell you that people did stand up for me. There were upstanders who risked their lives. When it was forbidden by law to help a Jew, this Christian man smuggled bread into the ghetto, gave it to me on a daily basis. He was the man who saved me from a roundup. He gave me the reins to the horses and take that garbage to the dump. They won't take me, but they will take you. If caught, not just he, but his family would have been executed. So here is a simple man, a farmer's son, who saved my life, who risked his own and his family's life. That is an upstander. A German officer is an upstander. A Nazi who defied his own peers. And he gave me life. He saved me from around up, going to a death camp, to direct traveling from. He just risked his life. He risked his life. He could have gone to the Soviet front that expectancy 25%, but he decided to help this skinny Jew. So the day go, you have two kinds of minds, people the way they think. The way I look at it is that those Nazis realized in the later years that they were lied to. All along, they were being misled. When they dealt with me, they have seen a human being, a human being that needed to be rescued. That's the difference. So I thank you for listening, and I'll give it over to this young man here. Thank you, Mr. Um, Noble, for that heartfelt and very thought-provoking presentation. I hope you guys learned a lot from that. Um, our next speaker is, if you've seen the artwork with the frames around, if you've had the chance to look those over, um, she is actually the person who donated this artwork so that we can show it to you guys now. Um, she will be speaking a little bit about the artwork and please help me welcome Shereen Lerner.
in the way they should. And I want you to think about what we call a ladder of prejudice, because this is what often happens that ends up leading us to inaction when we think that um, it's okay to stand by, as we heard, where people stood by and watched this. If we live, think of this as a ladder, um, the first rung of that is speech. And that's when people start to say things that are hurtful, to say things that could be damaging to people, um, that could be harmful. And people look the other way or say they're joking, or they look at the picture that you showed of Hillary Clinton where, with the Jewish star, which talked about her um, in that way, and say, well, it's OK, it didn't really mean what it meant. And people look that way. So the first rung is where speech just goes unchecked. When that happens, there's an avoidance that occurs. People are saying, well, it's all right, uh, because things aren't meant the way they sound. So it's OK to keep saying those things, but we're going to avoid direct conflict by saying, no, wait, you shouldn't be speaking that way. So people start to avoid that. Well, the third piece is what happens with discrimination. And I'm going to go back to that. But what basically we're talking about is both prejudice and discrimination here. Prejudice, <coughs> prejudice um, is basically a belief or attitude. And you just heard about prejudice that occurred. The images that you were seeing were part of a prejudice, an idea that people had about a group of people. It leads to scapegoating when you have prejudice. And scapegoating is blaming a group of people for things that are happening. We all know that that's happened, right? We can think of common, we can think of things that are going on today where we are scapegoating groups of people for things that are happening in our own country. Okay? That leads to prejudice because people then make accusations about those people. And people start to believe it. And that leads to stereotypes. Because when you believe in the prejudice that you've now got, the stereotypes that are there become very real for people. And that, if we look back at what happened in Germany, in Austria, in Europe during that time, a lot of scapegoating was going on. And this is, there was a lot more than this. I'm just bringing up a couple of points that led to this prejudice and bias against a group of people, the Jewish people, that led to discrimination. So thinking of prejudice as the belief or attitude that leads to the action. And the action is discrimination. And the action can get very severe to the deaths of many people. But it can also get very harmful in lots of different ways. Just as a question, how many of you feel that you have ever had any form of prejudice or discrimination about you or your family? It's a pretty good number of you that have felt that. So you understand what I'm talking about with that. So if we go back, we're now at the third rung. And now we have action that's being taken from the idea of what started with just maybe hateful words or comments about people that are being said that are basically stereotyping them leads to discrimination. The fourth rung is physical attack, and then the fifth rung is extermination. So what we heard, and what you know in terms of the Holocaust, is basically what happened on a ladder of prejudice and discrimination at that time. That basically, by people stepping back and not getting involved and not stopping that, it basically resulted in this ladder, in the reaching that fifth rung, extermination. And that's happening all over the world today, and it's happened in the past. So it's something that we continually see. And I think tonight you'll have some time to talk about some of these issues in terms of where are we seeing some of these things even today? And then what can we, as we've been, the call to action that we just heard, how can we not continue to have those kinds of things happen? What can we be doing so we're not standing there and saying, oh, they didn't mean it, or looking the other way, as we might have? So I wanted to sort of bring that in and bring that together as part of what you just heard about. And then go back to telling you this story, um, which is the story of Sonia, but also a story of her family. So the artwork that you see of children's art is hers. Sonia Fisherova was born in 1931 and died in Auschwitz in 1944. She spent, um, couple of years in Theresienstadt, which I'll show you where that is, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
This was her um, family. These were her aunt and uncle and her mother. Her mother is to the right, Mitzi. Her um, aunt, Josephine, and uncle, Kana. And this is where they were in the what is now the Czech Republic, but at the time was Czechoslovakia. From a personal level, my grandmother is the one on the left. That is Josephine. So this is her family that ended up in Theresienstadt and then in Auschwitz. Sonia is up there to the left, her sister Renee, um, and then her mother, Mitzi, and her grandmother, Anna. Um, Anna died in Theresienstadt of breast cancer. There was no treatment um, for her or help in terms of that. And basically, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story that happened, but to know that Theresienstadt was not a, an extermination camp. Theresienstadt was a camp that people were sent to. 15,000 children ultimately went through Theresienstadt, or Theresien, um, and uh, that under the age of 14, and only 150 survived of those that went there. So um, this is just a little bit of a history, but all of the slides that you see that I'm showing you are also all around the room over there. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story about Sonia. And I'm actually going to be using the words of her family. Um, we don't have the words, obviously, of Sonia, but some other family. Um, and to tell you a little bit about them. So this is Crystal Mom. Um, but I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story before that. Um, and this one is, this quote that I'm going to read you is from my mother. First, let me tell you the first time I heard about death. And this is my mother speaking when she was, she says, when she was 12 years old. Uh, Grown-ups don't tell children about death. And then one Monday, after a long weekend, I heard that the father of my second best friend, Liesel, had been so terrified that he decided to kill himself, his wife, and his two daughters. It took me a long time to understand, and I just hoped that my father would not feel that way. I didn't know what death meant when I heard that my uncle Alex had been killed by the Nazis for polishing boots badly. I just knew I wouldn't see him again. Then there were some ther serious things that sounded like fun because all of a sudden I was treated like an adult. For instance, what you see here, Kristallnacht. <coughs> On November 9th and 10th, uh, 1938, the Nazis staged some pogroms, state-sanctioned anti-Jewish riots against the Jewish communities in Germany and in Austria. And this was known as the Night of the Broken Glass in English, because my Germans, that's, I don't have any. Um, but it's a reference to the broken windows of synagogues, Jewish-owned stores, community centers, and homes that were plundered and destroyed during the pogroms. Encouraged by the Nazis, the rioters burned or destroyed 267 synagogues, vandalized or looted 7,500 Jewish businesses, arrested 30,000 Jewish males, and killed 91 Jewish people. They damaged Jewish cemeteries, hospitals, schools, and homes, and things burned down. And it was a turning point in history. My mother said she was sick in bed, and my parents had me answer the telephone. I was the only one with a telephone to speak to people who were looking for their relatives who had suddenly been arrested and disappeared. To me, it was great because I could talk to all these grown-ups by their first names instead of calling them Mr. and Mrs. So I felt like a grown-up, but I didn't really understand what was happening. I just knew I was being treated in a mature way. Children were not taught about current events. So she did not know, my mother did not know what was going on in Austria. She didn't know what it meant when Austrians voted to join Germany. And they voted yes almost unanimously. He was, Hitler was loved by the Austrians because he was Austrian. And there were a lot of celebrations. Children were kept home from school, um, but they could watch out the window when he won the election. And they had torchlight parades and a lot of singing. There had been slogans on how to vote. And by the next day, Jews were rounded up and on hands and knees had to scrub the pavements. My father had to do that. Um, this is me talking now, not my mother. But my father actually was pulled out. One day he went to school and everything was normal. The next day he went to school and they were brought into the auditorium. Anybody who was Jewish, including the professors, they were all brought outside 
They all got on their hands and knees and were surrounded and by people who threw things at them and spit on them while they cleaned the sidewalks with toothbrush and a bucket of water and never were allowed back to school. These kinds of things went on and people let it go on. And that's the point we were hearing today is these things happened and people let that go on. So now, a little bit about Sonia and her family. Um, this is the Czech Republic, in terms of where that is. In 1938, there was an agreement in Munich that permitted Nazi Germany to annex Czechoslovakia's areas of settlement that included them. And so um, the Czech army mobilized, but things changed. And over time, um, they could not really fight what was going on. And slowly but surely, more laws were being passed, lots of laws about what Jews could and could not do, where they could go, and where they could not go. In 1941, when Sonia was 10 years old, a law came that everyone had to wear a yellow star. In 1941 and 1942, the Jews were cleared out of Czech towns and sent to Prague. And in 1941, Theresienstadt opened up, and it used to be a fortress. They turned it into a ghetto and a concentration camp. So when she was 11 and a half and her sister was 15 and a half in August of 1942, they were deported to Theresienstadt. And this is a picture of um, Sonia and her sister as well as their cousins. And again, the cousins. So these were kids just like any other kid. Okay. So this is Theresienstadt or Terezin, Terezin, as it's known. Um, they were deported there. Um, as I said, the, the kids, her mother and grandmother, all were there. The father had gone out and gotten to England and was trying to get them to come, but he could not get visas and they were, before they were deported. So he ended up surviving without them because he could not get them out. Um, in 1943, the grandmother died, as I mentioned. So. What was Theresen's side? Or what was Theresen? Theresen wasn't really um, a, strictly a concentration camp. It was, or nor was it a ghetto. It basically had pictures <coughs> of both. But what it was was um, an area, it was a building or a series of buildings that were um, designed for 7,000 people, that it had 60,000 Jews were placed there. 140,000 Jews were there over the period of time that it was open. 33,000 died there. 90,000 were deported to other camps. In 1942, the death rate was so high um, that the Germans actually had to add a crematorium to handle 200 bodies a day. And this was not a death camp. Okay, this was a camp that was not designed for that. Um, 15,000 children came through there. Although they were forbidden to do so, they attended school. This is a picture of the barracks. They painted pictures, wrote poetry. Um, they, had, um, they were in plays, they played music. 90% um, of them died in the camps later. But here's what was important about Theresa's. And here's a picture of it. And this picture is important because of a picture I'm going to show you that Sonia drew. So it served a propaganda function for the Germans. A key element in the story of Sonia and her family is that in 1944, because of pressure following the deportation of Danish Jews to Theresa, the Germans agreed to have the International Red Cross come and visit in June of that year to show them how good the conditions were. So keep in mind, I said it was built for 7,000 people and there were 60,000 people there. So what are they going to have to do but get rid of the people? So um, that's exactly what they did. Because there were too many people there, 